inspector of the South Asia Institute. We are located in this building on the fourth floor. And I work very closely with Nara Megan. Most of you must have heard from her. She's our program coordinator. And Jenny does all of our outreach and website. Who's not here today. Um, very briefly, I'll tell you about the South Asia Institute in case some of you haven't heard of us. We are um, a university-wide unit, and our mandate is essentially to connect our faculty and students who are interested in building scholarship on South Asia. And we do this in many ways. One way we do here, at least on campus, is through these kinds of public events. And we focus on specific tracks which are based on critical issues that affect the region. So they are uh, urbanization, social entrepreneurship, uh, public health, uh, Muslim societies in South Asia, and, um, and uh, water and climate change. So those are sort of our main tracks. And what we do is we have faculty from various schools present on those various issues. We bring speakers from other institutions, sometimes from the region, who talk about these issues. And literally, we have an event a week. So you know, check our website and see what interests you. And please come to these events. It's really small, intimate. They're more like seminar formats. It's an opportunity for you to engage with the speakers. So that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we also give funding to our students who want to go to the region to do internships in the summer or even in the winter. We also give funding to students who are interested in doing research in the region. So that's another way we are supporting folks here on campus. We're very actively engaging with the Harvard India student group and Gopesh is the president there. And the Harvard Pakistan student group, we are the administrative mm -hmm. unit for them, and Iran mm -hmm. is the president of uh, the Harvard Pakistan student group. And so we like to engage with our students as much as possible. And it's literally whatever you take on as an issue that you would like to see move forward at Harvard, and you're willing to stand behind it and carry the flag. We'll help you with the publicity. We can give a little bit of funding. We can help with the organization. So this is sort of an example of what we can do. So what you're seeing here today really is a student organized panel. And the way we like to do this is, again, to focus on an issue that's relevant to the region, but also make sure that we're not just focusing from any one perspective. The idea of us being university-wide is really to bring in various schools and undergrads and grads together to think about the issue. Because as you all know, you know, when you go into disciplinary yeah, uh, right. conversation and queries, <laughs> the, it broadens and it also deepens the kind of questions that come out of it and then what you learn from it. So that's a very important piece. And then just last, one other piece I say that we would do on a regular basis is we feed on this street experience that we talk about often where we are funding students to go to the region. We have coordinators in Bangladesh, in Lahore, Karachi, and India. And what these coordinators do is help us connect with folks, institutions, think tanks, experts in the region, and help them connect with folks as well as students here at Harvard. So we try and do events in the region as well. Mostly it happens in the winter when faculty are traveling or students are traveling, or it happens in the summer. So those are things we like to do, other kinds of things we do. So just related to that and this event today, we're very excited because First of all, this topic is very critical, and it has been, you know, women have been working on this issue for many, many years, men have been working on this issue for many, many years, and there's still more work to be done. And so our hope with this conversation today was to think about how we can continue this on a long term, and how we continue to engage our students here, as well as folks in the region. So with that, I saw Jackie come in, so I'm going to now pass the uh, mic to Jackie, and then uh, we'll let you take it from here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies for being a little bit late. So, is this working? Oh. Um, so again, welcome. I um, be the chair of this panel. As as Mina just said, the panel has been. Um, uh, organized by a very dynamic group of students who, like many of us, I think, are very exercised about issues of uh, gender violence and social justice in the aftermath of the um, December 16th, uh, 2012 uh, rape in New Delhi. Um, and I just really see my role as, as uh, inviting the panelists to speak and then I hope um, engaging all of you, all of us, in, uh, in a fruitful discussion. 
uh, before I, I invite the first uh, panelist, I just wanted to make a couple of prefatory remarks. Um, I applaud the fact that um, our students have uh, taken the initiative to organize this panel, and I applaud the fact we here at Harvard, many miles away from India, are concerned about this issue and are prepared to do some work and some research and some thinking to offer our thoughts and our um, ideas uh, to solving, I think, what, what is one of the most urgent, but also one of the most difficult human rights problems of our time. I know, and some of you may also know, that there has been some criticism of, uh, of our panel, uh, criticism from comrades and colleagues and fellow sister feminists. Um, so I think well-intentioned uh, criticism, but criticism nonetheless. Um, and the, the burden of that criticism is simply to say, who are you, Harvard, to tell us what to do? I think I'm not misrepresenting too grossly when I, when I um, summarize it that way. And I just want to say um, two things, and other contributors will, of course, say whatever they want. Firstly, I don't think we have anything to apologize for, as I already said. We are simply engaging in uh, an activity which any thoughtful institution ought to engage in. Expertise does not come with a passport, and I really think that um, personally, and here I just speak for myself, but I know I also speak for the South Asia Institute, uh, we don't see these um, sorts of inquiries as uh, having nationalist bound boundaries or having a province which really dictates that um, people only of a certain nationality or regional or racial or other origin should participate. So I think we uh, vehemently believe uh, that we have a right to speak and to be listened to. But of course, and this is my second point, the prerogative of making decisions is with uh, the Indian government. And the Indian government, in its wisdom, will decide which recommendations are wise and which recommendations are helpful. And of course, nothing that we do is in any way intended to suggest that there aren't highly expert, competent um, researchers, activists, advocates, lawyers in India. Yeah, we would be foolish to suggest anything like that. Many of us have worked with these people ourselves and are, see ourselves as part of a similar movement. But I don't think um, we in any way want to arrogate to ourselves a special role as experts uh, preaching from on high. But we do want to participate with um, all the strength and the ability we have in uh, this global conversation, which I think is so urgent. So with that little um, preliminary remark, I will now... Um, hand over to my colleagues here. So who is going first? I'll go first. Okay, will you introduce yourself? Yeah. Or? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Noor. I'm a senior at Harvard College, um, majoring in literature, and uh, I'm also an intern at the Harvard College Women's Center. And uh, basically today, uh, this is a, actually a wonderful panel that allows us again, like Professor Bahaba pointed out, to talk about an issue of, of rape as a weapon as well as as a, as a crime that's being committed across boundaries, across uh, countries, and something that we all take very seriously. So I'm going to be talking about um, rape from a historic perspective, looking at it, um, looking at it through the lens of uh, partition and all the histories of the countries that I guess the South Asia Institute represents. Um, I personally come from Lahore, and I've um, and I have a and I have an interest in this in this subject, and I think that um, it's something that we that all of us should look at collectively as an issue of grave importance. Um, I'm going to preface my, my uh, short speech by talk, telling you a story. Um, last year, I studied this uh, very uh, famous Urdu writer called Manto. He wrote extensively on the on uh, the incidents that happened around partition and his very famous uh, stories called the Black Margins, basically focused on little uh, e events that took place, some of which were absurd, but some of the which were very powerful in their representation of violence that happened at the time. And the short spiel, spiel of this uh, story is that two men were uh, two men picked up a girl from one of their comrades, and uh, they basically raped her one after the other. And after a few questions, after noticing, looking after looking at her, they basically looked look, turned to each other and said, "Oh wait, that bastard gave her gave us one of our own girls. Let's send her right back to him." And that was the response. And the girl was basically. I guess she didn't even have a word of dialogue in this small um, essay. 
And I think this speaks to a larger question of what, how we consider women and how we consider women as subjects and objects in war, in fact. And let's look at what we know about the, the violence of partition and what we know about women during this time. We know that in 1947, an estimated 100,000 women were captured and raped. We know in 1971, in Bangladesh, 200,000 to 400,000 women were attacked. Looking at these statistics and, and a narrative from that time, we know that the overwhelming response to the plight of women during these particular times is that of suppressing them. And only recent, very recent academic scholarship has focused on uh, bringing out these voices. Um, for example, during, after 1947, we saw that Nehru convened a well-intentioned rehabilitation program for women who were affected. There were camps set up to help displaced women. We, um, Nehru said that we will not recognize forcible conversions of these women. Um, and female social workers, in fact, were very, very important in these efforts. But the real concerns came up after this rehabilitation program, where most women were not accepted back into their societies. The psychological scars remained. And, um, and a lot of women were effectively, especially the women who were being returned to Pakistan, were seen as bargaining chips by many pol politicians at the time, saying that we should use them as hostages. So we see that, and the same thing happened in Pakistan as well, uh, on the other side of the border, where in a, in a small city like Rawalpindi in that time alone, 500 women were abducted. And, um, and countless women committed suicide rather than risk being raped or taken by uh, the other side. So we see that the overwhelming narrative in 1947 was one of, of claiming nationalism and claiming a kind of ownership over the bodies of women and fighting out the wars on the bodies of these women. Then we see in Bangladesh that in 1971, only a small number of women who actually participated in the liberation forces and um, were, it was an astonishingly small number compared to an astonishingly large number that was systematic, systemic tar targets of male aggression. And it's unknown how many women were impregnated at that time as a result of rapes from the Pakistani army, but we see that some estimate it's 25,000. And the abortion, the abortion program that the government started after, these, after this, um, this incident, we don't know how many of ab abortions took place because at the time, no uh, government official and no, no one wanted to record or admit to having those abortions take place. So we also know that the children born of rape in 1947, in 1971, were seen as, for the, for the rape victim, they were seen as symbols of, an, of the other country's aggression. And for the country of aggression, they were a reminder of that aggression. They were children who were not accepted by either side of uh, this um, issue. So let's look at rape in India and, so, and rape in Pakistan and all these places today, and why is this history relevant to our discussion right now? We're equating this mass part tragedy of partition to a rape that took place in New Delhi. And we shouldn't, indeed, we shouldn't equate these situations because the men in Delhi were are very different from the gangs that roamed around in India and in Bangladesh and in Pakistan at the time. But we have to see that rape is rape. And overlooking this past is the reason why we have, we have reacted to, we have reacted late to a, to a system of aggression that's been taking place for the past 50, 60 years in our respective countries. Um, and I think it's great that it's happening now, but I think it's, it's really, really late. And I think as the, the time now is better. It's better now to start than, late, than later. Um, we can also, basically, we, we, shouldn't, we should look at the fact that even today, in situations like in 2002 in Gujarat, where countless women were raped because of their religion, it shows that there is still the system where aggression and uh, dominance of one cult or one community or one sect over another is basically carried out in the form of rape on a woman's body. And it's happened in 2002, it can easily happen again. And we've seen it happen on a young girl in Delhi. And for that reason, we need to look at rape in all its forms, not just as a, street, as a form of street violence or as a form as a crime, but we need to look at, look at it as a symbol of aggression, of holding power over another person's body, a body that's not as strong as, 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 as um, as, a, as say the male body, but we need to look at it in all its forms and that should hopefully inform our discussion today. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, my name is Abbas Jaffer. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student uh, in social anthropology, GSAS. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about masculinity uh, with regards to this um, rape incident and to the issue of rape and sexual assault more broadly. So I'm speaking both as um, a researcher who's interested in questions of masculinity, 
um, as well as somebody who's engaged in sexual assault awareness work for many, many years. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start with talking a bit about um, masculine poses and the Delhi rape incident. Um, in the details uh, of the case, uh, what's often lost are various kinds of masculine poses surrounding this act of violence. Um, the victim's male friend attempting to pump publicly call out a group of men making lewd remarks toward her, leading to a fight between them. Th this male friend being knocked unconscious, uh, 30 minutes of no one um, on this chartered bus intervening at all, and the bus driver reportedly uh, either inadvertently or more advertently trying to kill both the victim and the male friend after they were thrown from the bus. The police, courts, and activists uh, were all behind uh, the fast track trials that are now taking place, um, and signs went up across major metros in India, uh, like Delhi and Mumbai. For example, uh, over winter break, I saw a sign in Mumbai that said, rape is a disease, hanging is the only cure. One of the defense lawyers uh, for uh, one of the perpetrators, Manohar Lal Sharma, uh, engaged in very stereotypical victim blaming, saying that he had never heard of a rape of a respectable lady. Um, in a December 19th op-ed in the Hindu um, by Ratna Kapoor, she discusses something called the crisis of Indian masculinity. I'm sure you've heard this term, insert your country, and it's been written about uh, very broadly. Ascribing most of the rationale for why gang rapes are happening uh, in cities to male insecurity and displacement that is then vented on women. Where I think that otherwise sensitive writing like this goes astray, and many activist responses, is that it contributes to the idea that masculinity, as turned into an object of analysis, is something that is essentially associated with domination, and that reform of masculinity itself is the most effective paradigm for averting crisis. I strongly disagree, and I would like to briefly contend with this position and argue for a meaningful alternative that addresses violence in the context in which it takes place, and we'll get through to men who are both in communities as well as those who might be potential perpetrators. So a, a short bit about the colonial context. Um, much has been written about the narrative, rescue narrative of European colonizers rescuing Indian women from Indian men. And we can see these kinds of discourses reproduced in recent journalistic writing and international journalism about the rape incident. This is a trope that harkens back to at least the mid 19th century in colonial India. Scholars like uh, Stoller and Sinha have looked at how the construction of a certain religious and ethnic identity in South Asia was based on axes of the more or less masculine, sexually virile, and the relationship of British masculinity to these respective masculinities was an important precursor to post-colonial law and policy around gender violence. Furthermore, a preoccupation when it comes to masculinity and sexual violence is to make broad, sweeping statements about the Indian family, about the shocks of rural urban migration, and an economic determinism, i.e. men are losing jobs to women, that underlies the crisis of masculinity worldwide. And I repeat, I disagree with many of these generalizations. So here's my alternative, or here's my invitation to an alternative. Masculinity and gender violence are not isomorphic. They are not one and the same. Patriarchy, the rule of family and society by men, and masculinity are not the same. If, women, if women's rights work and feminist theory have shown us anything, it is that gender identities are not immediately value-laden. They come to be associated with certain values, characteristics, and actions, like violence, as part of a process. Masculinity defines a contextual relation between genders from a certain gender position, and it can take on many different forms. So the solution, in my mind, which is much tougher than either victim bashing or arguing for somehow curbing masculinity itself, whatever that means, is to interrupt the process by which abusing, assaulting, and dominating women becomes part of what it means to be a masculine subject. This is part of a wider phenomenon in India and elsewhere that inculcates sexism as a social fact, a lifelong sense of superiority and fears about women. I'd like to provide just a couple of, uh, or maybe one really fleshed out example since my time is short, 
um, about how this has been done. Um, so Care International is an NGO that works on issues of gender rights worldwide, um, and they ran a uh, program several years ago in Burundi with young men uh, dealing with gender violence, where they had groups, peer groups of young men, not necessarily having come through the criminal justice system, not having been accused of perpetration, but just groups of young men in communities, talk about the type of language they use when referring to women, and how language facilitates certain attitudes towards women. Um, and I think that uh, programs like this, uh, which deal with male peer groups, which deal with men in different developmental stages, and initiatives that essentially don't vilify uh, masculinity as a rigid object, uh, in my argument, uh, are bound to be much more effective and, much, and find much more broad-based support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on. My name is Sabrine Chowdhury, and I'm a dual degree MPA, MBA at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Kellogg School of Man Management. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, my experiences with an organization that I had called Out Against Abuse, which works to end dating violence and sexual assault on college campuses, and essentially works to educate the next leaders in the domestic and dating violence movement. Um, we've held countless workshops on campuses across the country, including the University of Texas, the Harvard Law School, George Mason University, and Brooklyn College in New York, to name a few. And our workshops are set up basically, um, as Abbas kind of referred to it, as peer-to-peer education workshops. So we have uh, students volunteer to act out small, uh, quick scenarios that um, dictate different types of dating violence from not just physical abuse, but emotional abuse, social media, blackmail, and most importantly, how to talk to your parents about these types of situations. Um, and time and time again, there have been three themes that I've seen in hosting each of these workshops. So one is the need for education and peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Second is um, the great importance that there is in having ma male-specific conversations and male education. And lastly, the importance of getting um, cultural and face faith-based institutional support for these programs. Um, so some of the experiences I want to share with our programs is each time I host these workshops, I'm sadly appalled by the demand that there is among South Asian youth for these programs. Um, even though I work with mainly second generation immigrant um, youth, uh, sadly what the, what the case is, a lot of um, immigrant parents come over here and hold on to those traditional norms um, of you know, shame towards dating, shame towards sexual assault. And so these children um, and these, these students are brought up in, to not discuss any of these issues. And so when they're faced with violence, they don't know where to turn. Um, something that I've also seen is uh, parental threats have almost become um, a new norm of violence in the sense that a lot of the students that I work with uh, will reach out to us and ask us for help because um, if they act on their own, the threat is that their abuser will go to their parents. And so it's dealing with how do we have a conversation that takes away shame um, from violence, that takes away shame from even talking about sex. Um, my second point about, and which Abbas referred to, in terms of male education um, is so important, especially within the South Asian context. So I want to share an ex a story about one of the first workshops that we held. Uh, we had a scenario where um, we had students act out, uh, a male student asking his girlfriend for um, notes and help in studying. And so she refuses and he like calls her names. And at that point, um, a male student raised his hand and said, but I don't get it, that's his girlfriend. Like she has to listen to him, she owes that to him. And it created such a disruption uh, in the workshop where other male students were very surprised and appalled that their peer was making these statements. So I think having uh, workshops that not only like push um, students to speak out and identify what kind of norms are like unspoken are very important. And also our workshops teach students to you know ask the question, what would you do if um, you saw your friend being abused? But also what would you do if your friend was the abuser, the perpetrator? Um, and I think those types of conversations are incredibly important. And lastly, the need for um, religious and institutional support. So 
Um, one specific workshop we did was at the George Mason University with the Pakistani Students Association. Um, and the students themselves requested that we remove the word dating from any flyers or any marketing materials, which I was extremely surprised about because these students had grown up in the States. Um, but once I got to the workshop, I was, you know, it was a huge turnout. There were so many questions afterwards about relationship violence. So we see that there really is a need for it, but again, a stigma that, um, students associate with it. Um, but after the workshop, I received an email from an imam from the local mosque who who thanked us for our workshop and said that, you know, he mentions domestic violence in his um, in his sermons every Friday and that there's such a strong need for it. And now we've also started to do these workshops at Sunday schools. And so what I'm trying to say is that there's such a need to have conversations with faith-based organizations and get them to support these initiatives. Um, and in terms of implications for the region itself, I think this speaks volumes to how important it is to have um, workshops at an earlier level, to have you know teachers be trained to talk to students about these issues, to have um, students themselves be educated on how to reach out for resources. Um, and I will say that we are hosting a workshop with um, at Harvard College with Harvard Men Against Rape on bystander interventions on March 11th. So um, I hope to see many of you there to continue the conversation. Hi, my name is Litsi Kurishingal. Uh, I'm a master's in public policy candidate at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I would like to talk about juvenile justice and the necessity of child protection services, which could act as a preventive mechanism in, in the case of sexual assaults and gender-based violence. So my friend's daughter, Dia, asked my friend um, you know, by the end of December, after you know, after being exposed to a lot of television, what rape is? And the easiest thing my friend could do is to avoid that question. She tried her best to avoid it as much as possible because Dia is only seven years old, and somehow she kind of put it under the mattress, and the conversation was over by switching the television off. So this is this is a common practice in you know, among Indian families. We don't talk about sexuality. We don't allow children or adolescents to know what, uh, you know, what kind of violence they could face or, you know, their normal um, sexuality they, that they should know about. But at least Delhi rape case is kind of uh, positive in that sense that, you know, most of the families in India cannot avoid but talk about rape. But today, I would like to kind of uh, focus on the other aspect of ra rape. Who are these people who are involved in rape? Wh what is the background of these men, who, men or you know any other person who is involved in committing rape as a crime? I would like to focus on juvenile. You know, one of the one of the accused in this case is a juvenile, as you may all know. Uh, if you look at his background, he left his home when he was nine years old. He was living on the street, you know, until recently when he was involved in the case. Do we know what what went through in his life, you know, in those 10 years? His parents didn't know where his whereabouts. So what kind of what kind of value system did he internalize and who kind of influenced this value system? This is something we often overlook. In my research uh, on child welfare committees and juvenile justice, I interviewed about 40 street children in Delhi this January. One common thing that came from the interviews was that street children who are often perceived as deviant children are children, actually. And they crave for a guardian in their lives. They look, you know, they, they really crave to have a mentor. And in, you know, due to the lack of good guardians or mentors in the street, often someone else steps in and fills, you know, fills, uh, takes the role, role. Usually it will be older boys, you know, who would be like a couple of years elder to, you know, to younger boys, or some deviant adults who see these young children as, uh, you know, as, as an object to earn more money. And it's very easy to kind of psychologically condition these boys and, you know, internalize whatever value system these deviant adults have. So, you know, they kind of get into pickpocketing and, you know, 
different petty crimes as advised to them by their so-called mentors. Now, in India, we have an amazing legislation called Juvenile Justice Act, as well as you know legislations like Child Labor Act, which could have avoided situations like this. Had Juvenile Justice Act or Child Labor Act stepped up and supported this, this accused and this crime when he was a child in need of care and protection, maybe we could have prevented one person you know, from the list of uh, sexual abusers. So I think there is a huge need of uh, strengthening the child protection services in India because we often look at street children or juveniles uh, on the street in, in a pitiful manner or in a negative manner. But the point rem remains that we have to kind of look at them as an investment to safeguard the future of India. We, the society, you know, the society as a whole need to be safe. So casual attitude towards social issues like street children, you know, we just cannot afford to do that anymore. Another aspect that I would like to bring um, is about uh, the press reports that talk about increasing juvenile crimes, saying that you know the, uh, the cr uh, juvenile crimes are including rape and kidnapping are on the rise. But if you take a closer look at those cases, we realize that these are not really rape cases or kidnapping cases, but these are just cases of elopement, because in India, adolescents you know, do not have, have a safe space to kind of express their opinion freely. During their sexual awakening phase, they would fall in love with a person, which would be kind of completely suppressed by, you know, by the adults who take a very paternalistic view. And many a times if you look at these cases, these are cases filed by the parents saying that the boy, in, and parents of the girls, saying that the uh, boy involved is kidnapping their uh, daughter or raping those daughters. And I interviewed a, at least a couple of girls in shelter homes who are either pregnant or is taking care of child of those juveniles who are accused of being in conflict with the law and is serving you know, their sentences in observation homes or in jails. So I think there is a, there is a grave necessity to, you know, to start conversation at home about sexuality, about sexual choices, and to give the freedom for you know, children as well as adolescents to speak for themselves. You know, I think there's a grave need to trust children and adolescents and to give them the confidence to make choices in their lives. Let Dia ask questions. Let all of us start talking about, you know, sexual choices so that we are in a better position to kind of address violence as well. Let's create positive external externality in the society by kind of strengthening our child welfare uh, committees and child protection services in India. And, you know, uh, to kind of empower children who are the future citizens who can make our lives better in India. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mariam Chuktai. I'm a PhD student at the Graduate School of Education. Um, I also worked very closely in setting up the Malala Fund. So my work, uh, I was basically recruited by Adam Ellick, who is the New York Times journalist who made the documentary about Malala a couple of years before she was shot. He is currently a Kennedy School student. So I was recruited more because I was from Pakistan and I was studying education and Malala was from Pakistan and was also a champion for education. So he was came to me and I was very happy to be involved. And we got a core group together and uh, launched a fund that became huge. We got Google, Twitter, all, all the way from Angelina Jolie to Gordon Brown um, involved and it became a, a, a smashing success by some metrics. But I thought what would be important for this panel is to sort of discuss my experience on the inside and my understanding of how violence against uh, gendered violence, uh, what, are, what are some real challenges that go beyond the headlines, beyond the surface level success that we try to feel good about, that we've written our $20 check and, and hopefully in my generation things will change. So if you just think of Malala Yousafzai, I, I'm assuming that all of us know about 
the person just as much as that she was a 14-year-old uh, champion for girls' education who was shot by the Taliban for uh, her demand for right to go to school. Um, but you can actually um, sort of imagine a sort of a snapshot and we can discuss this incident taking like the the narrative of each um, sort of person in this picture. So Malala herself is uh, the daughter of uh, Ziauddin, who is a political activist, uh, principal at a school, very much a champion of girls' education. Um, but Malala herself wanted to be a doctor when she grew up. Um, but she saw her father as a politician almost. Um, and she then said, maybe I will also go on to become a politician. But you see them as a duo. And then you take the terrorist um, narrative for a second. When, when the terrorist wanted to attack this cause of gender imp of women empowerment through education, they did not attack Xiaodin, who was really the more empowered duo in this, who was the champion of it. They attacked his 14-year-old girl in the school bus, um, which just speaks so much to how how much of an impact there is by attacking a woman in your family, uh, by attacking a girl. Um, and, and that in itself encapsulates so much of the problem that it was Malala herself that became the target of this violence f for the right of, of, for women to go to school. Then you go on and you, you try to look at the situation from the civil society's point of view, and you see Malala being used by everyone for their own political goal. Uh, people who are who are against drone strikes started to say, what about the thousands that are dying? What about the thousands of Malalas that are dying? So forget Malala. So they wanted to deflect attention from her. Nonprofits wanted to raise money for their nonprofits using Malala as the poster child. So you're seeing the violence against a, a, a girl child being used by different people in different ways for their own political and social purposes. One... Um, particular incident is, uh, was particularly troubling to me. It was uh, a, a conversation with a friend of mine with the exact same educational background as most of us in this room. Um, and uh, they, they said they had some family contacts back home, and they knew I was very actively involved with Malala Fund. There was a, there's a discomfort with sympathy when it comes to a victim of some kind of violence. And that speaks to the, to the extent to which this illness is spread amongst us even those who don't who aren't the the direct perpetrators of violence, but who who, who see this as a problem. So I, I was in conversation with this friend of mine, and he says to me, "But you know, um, when the 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 person uh, wanted who showed up and wanted to shoot her, this is like in a small school van where Malala was sitting with about three or four other schoolgirls. The man, he was a young guy actually, asked for which one of you is Malala." And they pointed towards her or said, and he started shooting right at her. Um, but my friend was narrating this incident to me. You know, when she was being shot, she actually hid behind this other girl. I was appalled by this narrative. That I was like, you know, if you were being, sh if I was being shot and you were sitting next to me, surely I will hide behind you. Uh, and, and, but you see, even in, amongst the most enlightened of us, even amongst the elite, there is this discomfort with sympathy for a victim who has been a violence, a victim of violence, particularly a woman, which is which relates to what Abbas was saying that if a woman has been raped, it is oh she must have been uh, a willing participant or she's she's actually a prostitute. It was a I think I read a statement by an Indian politician. It was a prostitution agreement that went wrong. It's not quote for quote, but um, but it was that was the essence of it. Um, that there is a discomfort with empathizing with a victim to to a very basic level. Um, the politician and the government, if you look at it from so immediately everyone is like, we will pay for Malala's surgeries. They were like 200 people that I knew who wanted to pay for Malala's surgery. But there were very few people who wanted to pay for Malala's cause. Um, and I think that uh, I will get towards, uh, towards the end when I talk about moving forward. Um, and then finally, the international community. So here was Gordon Brown, who did brilliant work in getting people together, got thousands of signatures together, went to Pakistan, President Zardari is, I believe, several million signatures. 
As though President Zardari was waiting for millions of non-constituent voters to sign a petition so then he would start to get, invest in girls' education. Now, I should also say that because of Mr. Brown's amazing effort in, in bringing people together, uh, a huge fund was set up with the UN's effort for girls' education. But where is that money going to go? How is it going to be spent? These are first-hand conversations I had that there was a point after which the international community is, by definition, international. It is not the local government that's going to do, that's going to take it up as a systemic issue. So um, I, and I, I just want to quickly run through these same players with the incident of um, Muhtar Amai, who was uh, sentenced to being gang raped. Um, and, and you see that when that happened, it was essentially the Jirga, the, the, the tribal elite who had issued this sentence against another crime uh, to her family. Um, the civil society had mixed messages about this, the same issues that the panel has already covered as to whether it was rape or not, whether she's a fluke. Just like in Malala's case, they were like, how can you be shot point blank and still survive? She wasn't really shot. She just wanted to move out of the country. So, um, and then it's particularly important in Mukhtar Amai's case is, in spite of the fact that there was massive, you know, uh, uproar about is this what our society represents? The Supreme Court, when it took up the case, was not able to establish that there was gang rape, and that is why that that is because um, the legal system is so disconnected with our cultural and historical realities. No, they couldn't find a single witness who would come up and say that there was gang rape because no one in the Jirga system would go against the Jirgas, the tribal elite, um, to come up and say that, yes, there was gang rape. So this also speaks to the disconnect between the government and what's actually going, to the, going on on the ground. So I, my just very humble um, learnings for fellow champions of this cause, uh, specifically from Malala Fund, is, uh, are, are two. One is that we need to be very perceptive of distractions. When the Delhi rape incident happened, and, and this actually speaks to the power of the civil society in India, that they were out on the streets and they wanted something to be done. Um, and I'm not saying that it was entirely staged or whatever, and I'm not saying that this political tactic is Indian or South Asian. You will see that in the you know on election night, Israel will, will decide to bomb Palestine the most because they know that that's when um, the media space, the headlines on newspapers will be, that real estate is, is, is allocated to something else. So in India, when the civil society was out demanding, that's when suddenly you see the India-Pakistan peace issue come up. And now suddenly we're talking about, well, the, you know, Pakistan is a real threat. So that, that's a distraction to get the civil society to calm down or to disempower empower people who actually want change. Um, and that's exactly why I felt that perseverance is so important and this panel was so important that even though Malala's story was uh, within a month or two overshadowed by General Petraeus's extramarital affair and then that became the flavor of the month, it is important that we we stay focused, um, that we keep going forward with the cause, which is, goes into my second learning that it is extremely important to not make these uh, these um, movements about the individual, but about the about the cause itself. Because if Malala, for example, had not survived in the hospital, people's hope would have di died with her. When Martin Luther King died, people felt that there will never be another Martin Luther King, and that, in some ways, becomes a disservice to your cause. So it's very important to keep people's attention away from has Malala started to walk yet or not, to has Pakistani government done anything about it? Where is that money being spent? Um, and and I, I think those are two things that I would share with people in this room. Um, thank you. So I think we have some time, which is great. Um, our panelists have covered... Um, I think a very interesting and wide range of different topics ranging from 
historical legal definitions of rape and, and what what we should cull from 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 history to questions of um, social norms and masculinity and, and, and gender and questions of shame and how we how we should think about that to uh, policy questions about juvenile justice and about education and about poverty and uh, street children and so on. So a whole range of, of different issues, all of which, of course, are relevant. So I think it would be great now um, to hear from, from all of you here what your, if you have questions or if you have observations, if you have ideas, um, if there are some of the statements that were made that you, that you agree with or disagree with and you want to add to, um, please let's, let's hear from you. And perhaps you could just, uh, when, you, when you ask your question, you could, um, you could uh, just identify yourself so we know wh who's in the room. Yeah. I just wanted to share, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on I mean, Delhi gang rape case is very unfortunate for the family and for the victim. But it's, you know, people say it's one of the best things that has happened socially for India. I mean, it's, it's, the amount of, you know, uh, protests and the amount of people that came out in all corners of the country has really changed things in a very drastic way. And it's followed like the, I mean, the third thing in, in India, at least over the last couple of years, first there was, you know, this anti-corruption movement where people, it was kind of ripe for revolution, people came out. Then there was a show by Amir Khan and Satyamir Jayate on social issues and, you know, 500 million people saw it. And this was the third incident and the largest one where it really brought the country together. And, and you know, a side note around this is that there was right after this in Bihar, there was a, a like a gang rape uh, convicted felon who was released just a few weeks after this event. And he had murdered and raped, you know, three people in the past before and he was released. And then he did the same thing with the fourth person after which he was put behind bars again. So, you know, I mean, I was shocked to read that in the first place, but I'm just, I, I was really, in some ways I was happy in a way that, that un, you know, this it's unfortunate for this woman, but it, it's really changed things for women's rights in a way that has never been done in the past. And I think that momentum should hopefully continue. So thank you. I think that's a very important observation and interesting to hear if, if the panelists have a comment. I, maybe I'll just start off with my own comment, which is that maybe I could just slightly rephrase your observation that it's not a question of being happy that this incident happened. And maybe it's not yet that things have changed, but certainly there's no doubt that egregious incidents, and if we think of this country, of the shooting in, in, in Connecticut, um, that they precipitate public attention. and They maybe give us a window of opportunity so maybe the onus is, really, I mean, we have this window now, I think, in India. There is, and, and maybe South Asia more generally, there is unprecedented attention to the issue. There is, um, you know, incredible media attention for probably many people in the room were in the subcontinent, or maybe some anyway, over the, over the winter break. And it's impossible not to notice that every single newspaper has day after day uh, stories of, of rape and of sexual uh, assault after December 16th. So it's a window of opportunity for sure. But um, I, I think, you know, my comment would be, let's really work hard and quickly. And, you know, the Verma Committee report, which maybe you know, many of you have read, and those who haven't, I would urge you to read it. It's an extraordinary document. You know, over 600 pages of first-class thinking and reasoning produced in less than a month really, I think, set a high standard for the sort of work that we need to do. But I don't think the time is unlimited. This is reversible. There are other issues which can come up. So that would be my take. But are there any other comments from the panel? Yeah. Um, I appreciate your um, your qualifier about sort of how to react to it and um, also about if things have changed. Uh, my feedback would be that uh, the protests were impressive. They were large in number. They were lo lo long in duration. And all of these things are um, surely notable. Um, I would question really if anything has changed at all. I'm very skeptical, um, particularly because the media coverage, uh, again, in my opinion, uh, is kind of voyeurism because of the middle class background of the victim. And I think until the Indian state, Indian civil society talks about massive and widespread sexual violence against women from lower caste and ethnic groups and more marginalized ethnic groups regularly uh, and with a sustained dialogue, um, that that's the majority of where impunity is sort of um, takes place, as well as in the homes, obviously, across uh, civil society. And, and 
Secondly, I would say that um, it's not addressing the issue of where the majority of sexual violence takes place, which is in homes and by acquaintances and extended family members. This incident is not emblematic of how most sexual assault takes place. And so to ignore that, which all of the protests pretty much that I've seen and a lot of the writing has done, um, is to ignore the real endemic nature of sexual violence and how it's part of many, many homes across the class spectrum uh, and across national boundaries in South Asia. So, but would you agree with, uh, with the spirit of the question, which is that this is something has changed in the public sphere? I mean, your comment is, is, is certainly sobering, but maybe is, are you too unrelentingly pessimistic? I mean, don't you think there has been there is something now which which one can build on. Don't you think there is some potential uh, room for, for, for movement forward? Yeah, let's take another. Noor. Uh, to, to that point, I agree with Abbas for the most part, but I think that one thing that has changed, um, which the protests obviously couldn't address because they're protests and they're not exactly dialogue. There are people on the streets. But I think one thing that has changed is that civil society, especially academics, journalists, students, they're very increasingly active online. And I think that the dialogue has become a lot more sophisticated and a lot more, um, it's become a lot more aware of the real issues pertaining to violence and gendered violence. And I think these issues that Abbas raised of uh, domestic violence and abuse and just the fact that there are so many other forms of rape that take place have manifested themselves through online discussion and that's one great um, part of the Indian civil society and the Indian middle class and just generally Indian um, uh, uh, the Indian community is that they've taken this on online and it's still alive and kicking and to Maria mentioned uh, that that the the media sort of shifted attention when there became an issue with Pakistan and it sort of like moved its lens away. But I think that that was tempered by the fact that the blogs were still alive and kicking and people were still tweeting about it and really angry about it. And even if the media isn't noticing, people are noticing. And I think that speaks to the online activism as well as the activism on the street that's really, really done well in this issue. Let's see. Um, I'm happy at the same time pessimistic. Uh, Banwari rape case, which was the, um, you know, a low caste woman was raped, uh, gang raped, because he, she was kind of supporting girls' education in a rural part of Rajasthan. It happened in 1992. The case still, I, mean, I don't think she has got justice even today. But it's glad that all these people, like, are coming onto the street and are protesting. Yet the disconnect between their perceptions and reality worry, worries me because they, can, they kind of perceive the rapist as, or the accused as some aliens who are an exclusive set of people outside the society who are far away from their reality, which is not the case actually. You know, all these violence takes place amongst us, within us, within homes, if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at the cases before child welfare committees, on an average, four to five cases of child abuse by either their fathers or their immediate neighbors. I mean, that's brought before the, I mean, per, every month. So, you know, the perception, I think, still needs to change. That emotional uh, outrage is respected as long as they don't lose their rationality and kind of bring you know, kind of have their perspective um, in the right space. I think it'll be good, but I think it's a great space which we should capitalize. And, you know, as students here, I think we have the potential to kind of maybe contribute towards, uh, towards kind of uh, increasing the momentum and, you know, taking it forward. That's a positive part of it, but I hope the reality sets in soon. I mean, I think history of India, there's never been like a CNN global number one story around a rape. There have been so many rapes in India, right? In terms of 1.2 billion hits for Satyamev Jayate, if you take a look at the internet penetration in India, that's phenomenal. And, you know, he did address a domestic rape in, in, in one of his episodes too. So I think when you talk to some of the, I mean, you, you say media, there's, there's only so much reach, but a dialogue is the best thing that you can have after this event. It's not, there's not going to be a, you know, immediate fix for this. So I think under the circumstances, it's probably one of the best things that has happened towards women's safety. And in Delhi, right after, there were, my friends said the trains were empty there, you know, just a few days in terms of the women's compartment and so forth. So there's been a real shaking up. 
I mean, clearly it's just a shaking up and it'll take a while for society to change, but that's the best under the circumstances. Okay, any other points? Yeah. So I'm Tisha and I'm a sophomore from Delhi and I was actually at home over with break when there was everything happening. And I think that while there are very deep societal issues, I tend to be slightly more optimistic because just the fact that three of you are from India or Pakistan or South Asia, and yet you're here talking about these issues and addressing these issues. And back home, I mean, just the fact that women are now starting to feel like they have a voice. There were so many of my friends, Delhi University students and girls, were able to go, they took part in the protests. So I think that even though, yes, it'll take time, the mere fact that women are realizing that they have to stand up and they're standing up and saying that demanding that something be done does represent a big change that's happening in society right there. Great. Yeah. Um, my name is Joanna. I'm here at the law school. And I think one thing, that, one thing that I always kind of struck by is a lot of calls for death penalty, um, amongst those kind of issues. Um, and I that a lot of the protesters were calling for the death penalty and that was sort of seen like there was so much anger and rage about this and it came out in trying to combat this violence by another form of violence and I just was very disturbed by that because there was not much talk about how can we address you know like you were talking about at a young age how can we get people to talk about this in the home instead it was more about you know let's ask for the death penalty and so I was wondering what your thoughts were on that? Um, I think because of the nature of the incident, it was a very violent, very brutal act. Um, I mean, the woman had, she had a metal rod shoved into her and it was a very, very brutal act that happened in a bus. This would, I mean, this would be a natural reaction to an act of what people consider barbarism. But I also feel like, and I'm no expert on this, so someone who's in the law school can correct me, um, but like the way, uh, courts in India have dealt with with penalties for rape has also been very problematic and I think people want a harsher punishment just because because they feel like in the past rape victims have or survivors was a more appropriate word haven't been getting getting their their ju their true justice like a judge and I think this law has been changed in recent years but judges used to um, they used to give the num like a lot a number of years based on say the woman the woman's behavior before or after the rape like say the woman had been in a been known to have relationships then the guy would get maybe 5 years or if she hadn't and she was a pure woman the guy would get 10 years or 15 years so the problematic nature of how rape has been dealt with for so long i think provoked this reaction and obviously someone who's a, a bigger, uh, an expert at this can correct me, but this is the sense that I get, it's like why it's influenced this kind of response from most people. Oh, I mean, I was just gonna add something similar is going on in Bangladesh right now where there are massive protests around this um, leader who had, um, I guess, regulated a lot of rapes going on during the 1971 war. And so the criticism behind it is uh, he got a life sentence instead of the death penalty. And so some people are asking, okay, are we fighting violence with violence similar to you? And I think it's the same exact thing you said. There's outrage in terms of how rape or rape as a war crime is treated and how the, I guess, punishment isn't harsh enough. So I agree that I don't think it's necessarily fighting violence by violence. People just are demanding more penalties for uh, crime crimes of rape. Perhaps I can just add something, maybe three points. Firstly, I think um, we need to distinguish between more penalties and more enforcement of existing penalties. And one of the big criticisms, you're absolutely right, there was an outcry in favor of death penalty and crustration and all sorts of, 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 of sort of, you know, knee-jerk gut reactions, which are, are common, but deplorable nonetheless. But there was also a sense of, in, of criticism of the enormous complicity of the law enforcement authorities, of the police and of the, uh, of the judiciary too, that you know, cases drag on and on and that um, witnesses, defendants, uh, you know, challenge the evidence of, 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 of the prosecution and so rape um, victims have to come back to court again and again and again. There was, while I was in, in Bombay just now over the break, there was a case of a girl who commits, committed suicide because like the case had been adjourned for the fourth time and she couldn't just couldn't face coming back to court yet again um, and telling the same story. So I think 
that there there has been both a call, which luckily the Verma Committee resisted, for you know these uh, brutal human rights kind of violative penalties, but also a call for a much more effective. Uh, retribution, because many people just don't get charged. Many people who get charged never get brought to court. Cases drag on. That's the first thing. I think the second thing, and this may be something that you and others in the room may be interested in, is there really is now some work to be done on more technical legal issues re relating to the definition of rape, question of marital rape, what is penetration, all these sort of technical questions. And, and I know that, that my colleague Diane Rosenfeld, who, who, who is an expert on this topic, along with many other experts in India too, but she is, is an expert on, on, on this in, in the US context, is, is proposing to do some work. And I think a, a group of us will try to offer some suggestions about just more technically how how the law can be framed. And the Verma Committee report already took on board many of these suggestions. But as some of you may know, the ordinance which the government of India has put out following the Verma Committee report rejects the recommendation of the committee that marital rape should be considered rape. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion to be had. But um, for those who are interested in, in you know, a more sort of technical discussion about some of these issues, I think there certainly will be scope for that, and maybe we can talk about that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, sharing your thoughts. My name is Nabil. I'm at the Divinity School. Um, and my question may not be super well formulated. Obviously, this sort of these sorts of issues are very complicated and have multiple layers has been addressed because there's local stuff going on, there's different interests, uh, there's legal issues, et cetera. Religion plays, could potentially play a role for good or for worse. Um, I'm curious though, at some, uh, asking a bit about some, something that a couple of you have hinted at um, regarding the lack of discourse around sexuality within families. I'm curious, uh, I know we, in terms of historically, uh, You've uh, uh, the sort of a little bit has been mentioned about colonial um, discourse, a little bit about what happened during partition. But I'm curious about why you think family, and this may not be particularly South Asia or anything, but why families are configured in a certain way such that these dis discussions don't happen, or or if they do happen, why aren't they like? Why do we still have the sense that they don't happen enough? Um, and also, um, if the family is not the most important space for things to change, um, or if it's not the only space, uh, Abbas, you mentioned a little bit about these peer-to-peer -peer sort of um, activities. I'm curious, um, I guess, if you think like, uh, if that's, if what else like that could could happen? I mean, how, um, like is, is um, like somebody mentioned getting faith-based and institutional support, uh, can religious organizations, um, or institutions be uh, sort of brought in? What role are they playing in South Asia at the moment? Um, uh, also, um, well, I forgot my last point, but yeah, you, uh, this question is sort of open to everybody. I know it touches upon um, a lot of different things. I guess I would also add also about in terms of sex education and how that is done um, across South Asia, or at least in the context you all are familiar with. Uh, Sabrina, do you want to take a start and then maybe a boss and probably everybody else? Um, and maybe yeah. we can also talk a little bit about um, what rethinking masculinity might look like, which we would be very interesting, I think, to add to this. Okay, yeah, Sabrina, go ahead. Um, so start with, starting with your second question, or broadly, where to change perceptions if not the family, and I think that's where education is key. And, uh, you know, even sex education in the United States is lacking um, in a lot of states. And so talking about healthy relationships, talking about what a healthy relationship looks like, um, and educating young males, most importantly, um, is a key starting point that we've seen, and also bystander intervention. So having peer-to-peer -peer support, as you mentioned, um, where the, I guess the burden isn't necessarily on social workers and other institutions, but on each other um, to uh, you know, create a safe space. And I think your second question about faith-based organizations as a way to help is important, um, especially with in terms of the South Asia context here and you know in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, um, a lot of families take advice from you know priests, from imams, um, and so enlisting their help 
I think is huge in creating systemic change of how um, we, we disassociate shame from rape or disassociate shame from domestic violence. Um, and so I think that's a good starting point. Um, thanks so much for your question. Um, so you raise a really difficult question, which is how did this all happen? Like why are families like this for a large part in many areas, especially um, if we're talking about the rape incident and similar things, we're talking about um, sort of middle class urban South Asia um, and some uh, norms around that. So there's a there's a really good um, edited volume by the scholar Sanjay Srivastava called Sexual Sites Seminal Attitudes. Um, and I would recommend it if people are interested in looking at issues of masculinity um, in various uh, South Asian contexts and masculinity and sexuality specifically. So not just about gender. So, and, and I think um, that's the key part of your question that I kind of want to seize on. So for example, Srivastava talks about how um, there's this idea that was recuperated really at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century um, about celibacy and something he terms semen anxiety. So this idea about risk, about women, about categoriz categorizing manhood as defining certain things uh, related to self-control, discipline, et cetera. The dark side of that being um, a sort of uh, outcroppings, resentment, et cetera, the fears of women that I mentioned right at the end of my talk. Um, and so I think that a lot of that has to do with the formation of um, issues and identities around masculine sexuality, especially heteromasculine sexuality, um, has to do a lot with this sort of anxiety, fear, and resentment, which combine in sort of a perfect storm um, in families and in communities. And, and, and where these in interventions can take place, um, I would just uh, add to um, you know, really important comments about uh, using institutions as an inroads because people look to them for guidance. Um, that also, sort of on the peer level, um, I, I think that uh, trusting people is self-organized if you provide certain resources uh, without saying sort of how they're supposed to form their groups, what they're supposed to specifically talk about. Just the idea is that the idea that you can talk about sexuality um, as a topic, first of all, is breaking ground. And second of all, in terms of reforming, not reforming, but um, sort of encountering masculinity uh, in its many forms and many avatars, I guess, um, is to say that, uh, it, again, that it's a process. And so um, a, a larger and more explicit awareness about sexuality and the role it plays in men's position in society and how they view women, um, I think is a first step that goes a long way towards addressing um, issues of um, sexual violence of men against women. Just really briefly, um, uh, Michel Foucault wrote in, I think, one of the volumes of A History of Sexuality about how sexuality is used by larger, broader institutions to really uh, suppress individuals, especially young people. And like he goes into a lot of detail about um, just the fact, the power of like suppressing something makes it even more desirable. And I think that's something that really speaks broadly to what's going on, I think, all over the world. And that's just a broad discussion of sexuality through Foucault's lens is really, really helpful. Um, speaking to the question of using institutions, um, really briefly, like I went to a private school in Lahore, an all-girls school, and for that reason I was very privileged to at least have been able to have this discussion. But at the same time, the kind of education we had was restricted to um, what is the cycle of pregnancy for a girl, and there was very little on contraception or uh, discussion on um, uh, how can a, you know how to use protection because I guess the concept was it was it was assumed automatically that that young girls, um, especially from the class I came from, are not going to indulge in sexual activities, and I feel like it's because it was just something it was assumed that we'd wait till marriage at which point we'll become pregnant, and you know so I think again. A, a, an awareness, even though we had the discussion on all classes and all levels of society, there needs to be, especially in um, institutions that have those resources to talk about it, like private schools, um, there needs to be the, the really the academics or the teachers taking a stance and saying that, you know, the girls have, regardless of whether or not we force them to say you're going to wait until marriage, a lot of girls don't. And, you know, we have to accept it. And I think that's just one, one thing from personal experience we should keep in mind. Listen. Um, 
I think uh, in India, at least family honor is closely tied to a girl's virtue. Uh, girls are constantly grilled uh, since, you know, I mean, their childhood that if a leaf falls on a thorn or a thorn falls on a leaf, the damage is will be um, on the leaf. So uh, every time, whenever we do anything, we have to be kind of mindful uh, of the fact that no tarnished image or perception will be, I mean, uh, will be kind of uh, fall upon us. A simple thing is like, you know, traveling by the public transport, uh, the bus. A girl would just, uh, in Kerala, I'm, I'm, I come from Kerala, which has a high, you know, um, highest percentage of literacy and highly educated people in India. So you get into the bus and uh, the space is segregated for male and female. In case if you happen to be in the middle space, you know, there's a lot of fingering where, you know, men would try to kind of, you know, touch, you know, touch uh, the female uh, in a very unsuspecting manner. Uh, but the, how how do the girls react to this? They just keep quiet and they wouldn't discuss these things at home because if they discuss it uh, with their parents, uh, it it could have adverse consequences like stopping her from traveling in the bus, which means stopping her from getting educated or working. So, you know, the family honor, I think the concept of family honor definitely needs to be redefined and uh, identity of the girl should be kind of separated. So, um, I can't remember who, who raised this topic, but can I just make one observation? Oh, sorry, you did. Which is that I think that um, and many institutional fora need to address this question because the family, of course, is embedded in society. So, one of the um, activities that I did this 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 uh, um, January when I was when I was in India was was to meet with a wonderful organisation called Muktanga, and I don't know if any of you have heard of them, who uh, do teacher training and they educate teachers across uh, the country actually to, um, and teachers, many of them drawn from the communities in which they teach, teachers in municipal schools drawn from the municipal school catchment area, um, to think, to teach more kind of creatively, more inventively, but also to open up topics which are sort of um, taboo. And so when when we had the meeting, when, when I was um, talking to them or talking with them um, so after December 16th and we talked about sex ed and, and sexuality and they said that they thought that um, it would be essential, for example, to talk about menstruation in the classroom, to talk about menstruation with boys, to give boys an opportunity in a kind of safe space to just hear these conversations without, you know, feeling embarrassed or feeling that they had to show off or whatever. And I think that is so critical. Just even to use these words like vagina or menstruation in an Indian classroom would be explosive. And uh, so I think that, that that's one f forum which, um, which really needs to develop, which then helps families. It helps, you know, parents who are looking maybe to be progressive but are worried about what the in-laws will think or what the wider, you know, extended or other family or village members might think. Helps them to, to, to support a more sort of rights-respecting uh, dialogue. The other thing, of course, is the media. And... Um, both television and radio, I think, are now very engaged with these issues. So, you know, as you probably know, there are some wonderful big Bollywood stars who really discuss these sorts of cutting edge social issues in a very progressive way and are really trying to bring into the forefront using their sort of glamour appeal some of the uh, hard questions that otherwise get neglected. And similarly, across the country, there are community radio stations, uh, again, which some of which I participated in, where people are raising these issues in rural areas, trying to begin dialogues, thinking about, for example, the Tata, uh, and Tata, Foundation is funding um, a whole program of writing sort of what in Latin America called telenovelas, you know, these sort of um, like the new girl or girls, these sort of episodic uh, television programs where you get drawn into the life of a family or whatever, but where you feed in these progressive social themes, you know, so maybe, you know, a, a daughter is having a relationship before she's married and maybe even, a, you know, a son is gay and maybe, who knows. So the, the, trying to, you know, use television and the power of television and also the appeal of, you know, Bollywood stars, which is so enormous, to 
start broadcasting uh, more progressive messages. So I think, you know, we don't need to despair just about the, you know, conservative nature of the Indian family. We need to think of ways in which, um, you know, the contact with institutional processes can, can really drive change. And I think some of that is beginning to happen. Yeah, there's a question, yeah. My name is Carolyn Poinelli, and I'm from the outside community. And I think one of the things that hit me was when somebody mentioned the police. And I have to say that in turn, when I think of um, of rape, it's just sort of a, a it's like I wonder why anybody is sort of surprised because the violence in society, and I'm talking about the violence um, that um, the military, the police, it's not that they're there to do it. It's that um, that they sort of, it's sort of endemic that there are certain things that go on. And it's not just rape of girls and women. It's even young boys. It's just that anybody can be a victim. And that institutions, I mean, the Catholic Church is a primary thing, although it's not South Asian. But I was thinking that so often, and in films also, that um, violence is accepted or snickered at or something like that, or people just don't pick up on it. But these, um, and then when it filters down into society, we wonder, oh, gee, there's a problem, and we try to fix the um, the result instead of going to the problem, which is the violence. Sometimes it's institutional, and um, frequently it's on the high end of the um, of the social scale. And frequently there are people that we pay and respect, like the police. You know, I was thinking police, judges, and you know when somebody was saying about General Petraeus's affair or Bill Clinton's affair or something, it, it's like. You know, they're never going to be prosecuted. You know, it's so that I think that this is, it's so systemic in society and um, I, I don't know, in, in Western society and I'm sure in South Asian society too. But I don't know how it relates to, um, to this specific thing. But I would say, you know, you can't leave the police out if you think that they're going to be the, the answer to your problem. Can I comment? Uh, I I agree with you that uh, it's a, a, a gradual shift of all of us, not men and women separate, towards a more violent society. And to have this converse, conversation in that context and to be talking about what can families do to reverse this trend is a tremendous sort of uphill battle that we're up against. But I do want to qualify what my comment about General Petraeus because I think that even at that scale and in a completely different random context, you see the exact same issue come up, where you see uh, an issue of an extramarital affair looked at from a different lens when it comes to a woman and a different lens, a different standard for a woman and a different standard for a man. Um, so it's not, and, and that speaks to your point of, you know, violence against a woman can, can be, you know, being shot point blank but it can also be by holding women to different standards than men. And I'm not going into details about you know, who did what, and, but I'm just saying that the issue that you're pointing out, that this, um, this bias and the, these two standards that we have and the ubiquity of violence is something that is a human being issue. It's not a gendered issue in many levels. Um, yeah, I'll just say briefly that uh, your point about institutions and norms is well taken. So I spoke a little about norms before in all-male sort of peer group situations. So um, even despite demographic changes, um, it, it's definitely in the South Asian context, you know, the military and the police are overwhelmingly male, sort of male-centric, even though there are women in both arenas uh, in several South Asian countries. Um, and I think that uh, sort of uh, gender norms that are held and propagated by these institutions then have an impact on the wider society. So uh, if there's a view, a uh, person on the street 
sees that the police have a disrespect for a woman who's a victim of sexual assault, abuse, or even eve teasing, like the whole spectrum, sort of uh, from uh, verbal harassment to full on assault. If there's a disrespect and a disavowal and a, a dismissal of that, um, that's going to have certain long ranging impacts. And so uh, an important question to ask is, how do you move from that kind of norm or that sort of um, reflex reaction on the part of um, some people who are in law enforcement and um, in the military and in war contexts um, to a model where that's not the sort of the automatic or the easiest reaction? Um, to your point about violence in movies and in the media, I guess specifically in the Delhi context, there were People have discussed this in a lot of on a lot of online forums that um, there was a period in Bollywood cinema where in the 80s or early 90s the sister figure of the hero would basically constantly be raped and the hero would come in just for the purpose of saving her and become the hero and that figure of the woman the sister whose you know whose virtue is is at stake um, was a was a very popular trope in Bollywood. And you know now today we have the system of sexual women who just come in to have dance numbers in Bollywood movies. But I'll say this with a with obviously take it with a, a grain of salt that we cannot blame the situation in um, the the rape in Delhi or in fact many many rapes on the fact that there's a culture of or there was a culture of violence in Bollywood movies or say mov all movies for that matter because. The fact remains that every single rape, and we've talked about this at great length, it takes place with a specific context or with a specific, um, with a specific kind of uh, mindset. And for example, in this Delhi gang rape case, these were boys and men on the streets who perhaps, um, who perhaps, you know, we don't know what they were thinking, but we know that they didn't, that 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 Bollywood and movies, especially, wouldn't have have uh, provoked them to carry out that kind of violence and and um and extreme violence the way th the way they did and so while we can blame a lot of social uh of, of a lot of media and social ills on it we can't make that we can't make that the our our sole um point of entry into looking at a society and the violence in that society because there's a lot more more going on there so i think we have the last question yeah Yep. Okay. Um, Where is the mic? Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to raise a question about um, you know the way people socialize. Uh, so, so there was a mention of uh, you know boys in school perhaps needing to be sensitized about women. You know, uh, you know biological kind of sexual sexuality related issues. But more than that, it's uh, I mean, if there's an all male gathering. Uh, you know, a Pakistani or Indian all-male gathering, the kind of discussion that takes place is very different from a mixed gathering and from, an, uh, from a female-only gathering. And the kind of things that uh, people will say in an all-male gathering, uh, I including the kind of things they'll say about their female acquaintances, um, you know, sometimes really cross lines that shouldn't be crossed. But then when those same people get in a mixed gathering, there's almost like, you know, they'll be totally different individuals when they actually are, you know, psychologically perhaps are somewhere in between or, you know. So I think that aspect of the kind of conversations that people have, uh, you know, uh, does need to be addressed. And I was wondering if um, some of you could shed light on that aspect. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say briefly, um, Akul, I really appreciate that comment. I think that gets to one of the heart of sort of this, these issues of how um, certain views towards women are normalized for young men. Um, and the, the difference in the conversation thing, I think, is, is central. And I would actually call that a genre of sort of bystander intervention, even though they're not bystander. You usually know the person if you're in a group of guys talking. Um, but intervention um, that takes the risk of cr making a situation slightly awkward or slightly uncomfortable or slightly less chummy or fun for a second or for a minute um, to intervene. Um, because those are the tough times in which um, you hear something, you know, uh, putting down someone else's uh, female friend or someone's girlfriend, family member, et cetera, whoever, and it happens frequently. You're absolutely right. And the question is, 
you know, how to intervene in the most effective way possible that doesn't make the other members of that group shut off, and, and how do you get them to hear what you're saying? Um, and I think that's a huge challenge. I don't have the answer for that. Um, on on that remark, I was. there are a lot of programs in the U.S. now that I think we can model um, after. For instance, Jackson Katz has this program he calls the MVP program, which is he goes to universities and talks to groups of um, all-male athletes. And what he does is he brings in um, someone like himself or um, someone older who can talk to these college-age students about what it means to be a strong male. Um, and I think what the point you raised is exactly right, that when you're in all-male spaces, the discussions you have are very different. But then it's also, you create an environment that can be more powerful. So when someone makes a negative comment, if another male who the group, uh, you know, sees as superior or sees as someone they want to embody, says, you know, I don't think that's okay, or I don't think that's a right remark to make, it really does make a difference. Um, and so another example is uh, the White House has an initiative right now to end dating violence, and they launched a PSA um, full of athletes saying, you know, dating violence is wrong, this is how you should treat a woman. And so that, again, goes to how we can use um, really strong male figures, maybe even in Bollywood, um, or have all male conversations in schools in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh um, as a way to change uh, those social norms towards women. Thank you. Would um, any panelists like to make any closing remarks or anything you haven't said that you'd like to say? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, it, it actually relates to what the, the point that was just brought up because essentially what you experience in that moment, and I have not been in those conversations, they are obviously happening behind my back, so I'll take your word for it. But uh, essentially what you would be experiencing is um, the objectification of women which they cannot do in the presence of them. And that microcosm sort of objectification of women you know is the same uh, as, you know, the person who will throw acid at, on a woman's face and in a way devalue her in society, devalue her as a daughter because now she cannot be married off, uh, devalue her because she cannot work and she will be a social awkward uh, entity, socially awkward entity walking around. So it's, it's a very serious moment because it's the day-to-day -day objectification that we need to have our sort of perceptors high and uh, alert for. Um, and and I, I personally know of a story uh, of this woman that I worked with that who was thrown acid uh, on her face by a put a suitor, who, a rickshaw driver, who wanted to marry her, and she turned down her proposal, his proposal, and he threw acid on her face saying that now no one else will marry you, and you have to marry me. And you will find that parents, if a woman has been a victim of rape, because a woman is, is perceived as an object, that they will marry her off to that same man, because they cannot understand that this object can be used by more than one person. So it is essentially the objectification of women that's happening even in those conversations the same way it's happening in that rape uh, situation. I just, um, um, I'm, I'm also kind of worried that you know, marital rape is not in one of the recommendations in um, GS Verma, uh, Verma Committee's proposals. But I'm also thinking like beyond marital rape, I'm just wondering how many uh, wives in South Asia know the concept of sexual consent. Like marriage and kind of submission of their body to their husband is so ingrained in the uh, mindset of, you know, women in India, in South Asia in general. I think there has to be some steps uh, to create that awareness of, among wives that, you know, they actually have rights over the body and there is something like called sexual consent exist. Um, I don't know if there are many initiatives towards it, but I hope there will be conversations to work towards it. Thank you. So um, thank you all for wonderful presentations and thank you for, for great questions. Um, uh, Nora is stand, has been standing outside and has been missing this amazing seminar. 
Um, she has an amazing sign-up sheet for this Beyond Sex Equality Policy Task Force under Diane Rosenfeld that's being convened. If any one of you would like to continue to stay engaged with this and with SAI's work, please put your name and um, email address. We'll be in touch. This is going to be developing through the summer and through the next year. So it's long-term engagement. Obviously, tell your friends. This is going to be open for sign-up and we'll put a note on the, on the website. One other thing that we wanted to do, which we were very keen on doing, is the five panelists have addressed all kinds of issues but we were trying to do the structural breakdown of it so we've put some chart paper outside and we've put the headings of what the speakers have said with just some markers and we'd love some of your comments and thoughts ideas that were sparked that maybe you didn't bring up we really want this to be very collaborative and we'd love to hear from you it can be something that somebody said it can be something that wasn't addressed anything that you'd like because this is a student panel so we want um, an interactive student panel so be very kind of you if you do go populate those over the refreshments out there thanks thank you and thank you so much at south asia institute for organizing this with the students it's great